So Izzy, I, yeah. first on the list, I think, Izzy, if that's okay. Um, Lucy, what we're going to do is we're going to, we've got a couple of things to do, first of all, if that's okay, and you can kind of get used to how we rattle through things, and then um, we'll come to you if that's all right, okay? So Izzy, over to you. You've got a few things to tell us about the um, website, I think. Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, so yeah, just in case um, some people don't know me, because um, I'm not called Devon Care Homes. My name is Izzy. I'm an administrator at Devon Care Homes Collaborative. Um, so first kind of half of the session, we're going to be talking to you about data security in um, care, because um, you might kind of have heard DCHG is kind of working with the CCG to um, launch the Better Security, Better Care contract in um, Devon, Plymouth and Torbay. Um, so this project is all centred around the Data Security and Protection Toolkit, um, or shortened to the DSPT. So a brief description of what this is, um, is that it's an annual kind of self-assessment tool to see, um, assess your level of data security in your home. Um, it's a recognised kind of tool which is used by governments, local authorities, CCGs, um, NHS, NHS Mail um, will want you to have the um, DSPT, as well as kind of care systems which enable you to access kind of shared care records, um, will want you to have the DSPT. Um, DCHC are here to help you through this process. Um, so we are aware that everyone might be at different stages of data security in your home. You might know uh, a bit, you might know a lot, or you might know nothing at all. Um, so no matter what stage you're at, um, we are here to kind of help you through this process. And um, over the coming months, this will be through webinars, workshops, one-to-one um, -one support. Um, so, you know, at any point, feel free to reach out to us because yeah, that's what we're here for. Um, I just want to briefly show you our website, which we have just launched. So if you're kind of thinking um, about introducing some more digital skills um, or just seeing what's kind of out there, um, our kind of website has got some resources, feel free to explore um, as, as you know, a light introduction into kind of digital um, skills in care. Um, so digital social care and skills for care have some really great resources. Um, and for the DSPT, um, this is our DSPT hub, which will be kind of, you know, updating as we go along with things that people find useful for the toolkit. Um, so if you want to find out some more information or if you're kind of thinking about completing the DSPT soon, we have got lots of resources um, available to you. Um, it's definitely come in handy if you're kind of thinking about completing the DSPT. And we'll also have all the information of our events that will be kind of running over the coming months. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing now. There we go. <laughs> um, so yeah, feel free to kind of use this as a resource and use us as a resource. Um, but I'm going to hand over to Richard Jackson from Clearcom, who's actually guided a lot of care home providers through the DSPT um, before, so um, has a very good take on it. Um, Richard, I'm just going to make you the co-host so that you can share your screen. If I can work out how to do that again. Richard, whilst we're um, on that, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Uh, yes, I, I can actually go straight in and do the intro, if, that, if that's okay. Um, Sorry, I'm having some issues with the screen share that two seconds. That's okay. I think it would be really interesting to see um, in the chat bar, actually, if, if anybody is feeling a little bit overwhelmed by the DSPT um, talk as well. But in, you know, we're hearing a lot about it as we, as we go forward. I know Lorna and Izzy are doing an awful lot of work on this. And Richard, your contribution is very, very timely. But it'd be yeah. really interesting to hear, you know, what what do, what is DSPT? What does it stand for? And um, and just to hear, you know, what in the chat bar, just indicate, even with a hand up, are you feeling sort of thumbs up, good, good, or thumbs down, bad about it? Over to yeah. Richard. 
here. Struggling to get the top bar to disappear so I can actually start the, start the uh, PowerPoint. I don't know, I've never had this issue before in Zoom. The top bar should just drop away. Izzy, Izzy can you um, manage to do that? As in the, um, the Zoom? Yeah, the Zoom top black bar is not, not moving out, which is just stopping me from pressing, from actually starting the PowerPoint. Um, let me... I do Normally, I'm, I'm trying video. to get home. Has that done anything? No. No, I think we can still see the slides, so um, unless... Yeah, I mean, just in two seconds, it will be an awful lot better because the yeah, uh, sure. those animations are the same. It'd be really interesting to know, actually, just from a thumbs up, thumbs down, um, how people feel about the DSPT. You know, a thumbs up, I'm okay with it. Yeah, I've heard about it and I kind of know what I'm doing. And a thumbs down is a kind of absolutely no idea what you're talking about. Or, yeah, I went through a very painful process and hope not to repeat. <laughs> just gives us a feel for you know, when we're doing the webinars, how many will do at introduction level? Because we'll, we'll pitch them to what you need. It's just standing what you okay. need. I am done. Can people see me? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Are you getting the full screen? Yeah, and I've got yeah. a couple of thumbs up too. Fantastic. Sorry about that. That's never <laughs> happened before. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so everything will be explained now. So I've got 15 minutes to, to talk about the, the DSPT, but also to set the scene with regards to why the DSPT is so important, because I think it's it's really key to, with any project, to understand why you're doing something rather than just going about it because you have to or you've been asked to asked to complete something. Um, so a bit of a brief overview of myself. I'm Richard Jackson. Jackson, I'm an EU certified GDPR, GDPR practitioner, also specialised in information security uh, principles, and I'm a project manager as well. And that that comes in really useful when I'm working with care homes or any kind of care provider with their DSPT. Uh, Clearcom as an organisation, why we're involved in, in, uh, in health and social care. So we're a specialist cyber security company based in London, although I'm based in Cornwall and, and I'll be working for HAC for my foreseeable uh, future. Um, part of the MORE group, so we have over 30,000 people spread across 100 companies, uh, countries, but very, very personal in terms of our, our delivery model. Uh, and what we're going to talk about in the next 15 minutes, what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to set the scene in, in respect of why information security is so important in health and social care. And then it's going to be all about the DSPT, what it is, what's its purpose. I'm also going to talk a little bit about the CQC and the DSPT because they're becoming more and more aligned. Uh, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. Uh, I will apologise at this point because I'm going to have to kind of run through it at a bit of a steady pace. Um, but any questions, can, we can go back on, on slides that have maybe gone through a little bit too quickly. Um, so setting the scene, why are we talking about data security and care? So the best way to, to, to prove this and to evidence it is, is in this, this graphic. So this is UK statistic, but it's very, very similar from a global perspective. Health and social care accounts for nearly half of all uh, data breaches in, in organizations or business for some very specific reasons, which we'll cover as I move through today's presentation. Um, so that's a quite startling number. So if you compare it to financial, educational, government, they're all obviously below 10%. Health and social care is way out there on its own in terms of, of data breaches, whether that's a malicious cyber attack or accidental breaches, which are more common. Um, and in terms of what causes data breaches, for the most part, it's people. So when we talk about cyber security, the, the traditional view is it's a techie subject, it's all about IT. Um, it's not, it's actually mostly about human science and it's about how we are so easily trusting of things which come into our email inbox or into our text uh, and how we respond to it and why that causes data breaches. It could be employee error, such as sending an email to the wrong person. It could be a lost or stolen device upon which you have maybe sensitive health data or access to your, to your business system. Or it could be a criminal attack, which could be a phishing attack, which is when you send an email and you click a link that you shouldn't click. But if you add those three large slices of that pie chart together, you can see that it's over 90%, 80 to 90% of, of data breaches are caused by people 
which is why education is such a huge part of this subject and why it plays a big part in the actual DSPT itself. So why is that stat so high in terms of that 43% that, that health and social care has breaches? Um, so there, there are kind of four factors, I think, that come into play. So there's a growing investment in health technology. So as care providers, you'll be in, encouraged constantly to invest in health tech to, to make your lives more efficient and to provide better services. But alongside that, there's a minimal investment in cybersecurity. So there's a huge investment in health tech, not so much in, in the actual security of that technology. There's a widespread lack of GDPR and data protection awareness in this sector. And then there's the COVID-19 cyber threat, which I'll talk about in some, depth, in some depth as I move through, because COVID-19 has acted as an accelerant in respect of cybercrime. Um, and those four things together present a disaster scenario for health and social care um, over the next sort of five to 10 years, but it's also very immediate as well. And a useful graphic to kind of demonstrate that is if we look at February and April 2020, uh, when we saw that uh, people, for instance, if they could, were going home to work, or the, the care sector, care homes in particular, became under constant pressure, incredible pressure that the likes of we've never seen before. Uh, we saw that digital adoption and the maturity, so that's investing in health tech, care management apps, et cetera, uh, going up and up and up steadily, but the security focus, again, just wasn't wasn't happening. So we've got that big gap that we're showing there with the blue arrow uh, on the screen, and that what I would call the cyber security hunting ground, cyber crime hunting ground. That's where cyber criminals will will profit and their opportunities to, to hack the health sector and to hack you as care providers is, is growing, growing steadily. What we're also seeing from March last year is we're seeing a very, very apparent digital health adoption um, over the last 12 months. So these milestones are really interesting. So we can see that around 5 million health apps are downloaded every single day. 80% of those apps don't meet NHS standards. Uh, and that's important to, to note because we're talking about NHS standards with regards to the DSPT today. 1.5 billion apps are out there that don't meet NHS standards have been downloaded. And there are 750 or more apps to help track, inform or gather COVID-19 data, which is incredible. Uh, and approaching 900,000 people in the UK have downloaded the Couch to 5K app in 2020, which may seem harmless, um, but that, that app is collecting health data on a constant basis. So you've got coming on for a million people there that have signed up for, for Couch to, to 5K, uh, and that's 92% increase compared to 2019. And that data is from Orca, which has been released today. Now, health data, I mean, it's really important at this point to note, well, why is health data so popular? Why, why are health organizations being hacked? And Stephanie Domas, uh, who's an American, the executive vice president of MedSec, gave three really big stats at a TEDx talk recently, um, in that 67% of all identity records breached are from health and social care, and there's a reason for it. So your stolen credit card number is worth about £1.50 on the street, whereas your electronic health data is worth around 10 times that. It's worth between 11 and 15 pounds. So when we hear about data breaches and reassurances uh, from those organizations that have been breached that credit card numbers were safe and that they weren't involved in that cyber attack, that's spectacularly missing the point. So credit card details are not an issue when it comes to cyber crime. Health data, sensitive data, the likes of which you guys will be processing on a daily basis is much more relevant in, in respect to cyber attacks. The reason it's so valuable is because it contains such, such sensitive data, such as bank details, national insurance numbers, home address, telephone numbers, email addresses, medical history, family contact details. Um, it could contain issues about ethnicity, all types of data that would be considered sensitive and special category under the GDPR. Um, and in comparison with your credit card, if you, if you lose your credit card and there's a spend on it, that will be probably reimbursed as part of the insurance on your card. It's, it's inconvenient at worst. If you lose your health data, it's out there forever. Um, and this is why it's so important as care providers to have good data security standards in place. Uh, and a very, very uh, well-known health security, uh, cyber security expert, Jean Frederick Karcher, is saying that hackers can sell large batches of this stolen data for profit on the dark web. The NHS is a big target because of that. And medical information, again, is saying that 10 times worth, uh, worth 10 times more than credit card numbers and that fraudsters can use this to create fake IDs and buy medical equipment or drugs. They can use patient numbers. Uh, and in the most part, 
we wouldn't know that those data that data has been stolen. So this is all data that care homes will be processing and storing on a constant basis. I referred earlier to the COVID-19 threat in respect to cybercrime. Uh, in April last year, Google was announcing that it was seeing 18 million daily scan emails related to COVID-19 over seven days. Um, so what was basically happening, happening from the data you can see on the screen there is that the cyber criminals very quickly realized that COVID-19 was an opportunity for them to do harm because people were either working from home or they were more susceptible to scams because they were uh, physically and mentally run down, especially if they're working in the care sector. And also if those cyber criminals were offering fake links to procure or buy medical equipment, PPE, um, hand sanitizer, et cetera. That was quite common over that, uh, that two month period from April to May last year. And the COVID-19 threat, threat coalition in, in the US, very similar stats. So they were seeing around 5,000 domains, so that's websites or email addresses being registered daily, including fake World Health Organization uh, websites, even fake websites for nation states. So countries were being spoofed um, and the, the population of those countries were being tricked into thinking they were getting emails from, from their government and they were not. So how is all of that possible? So really it's all about your employees, it's about people. Uh, human error is the number one cause of data breaches. As I mentioned before, it's responsible for 80 to 90% of incidents. By the end of this year, cybercrime will cost around five trillion pounds worldwide, and it's already worth more to criminals than the entire global illegal drug trade, which is quite a sobering thought. So when we think about cybersecurity and it affects big business, that's not true, it affects all of us. Um, countries, nation states are involved in this because they're making more money out of it than uh, the illegal drug trade, which some of them may be involved in. Um, cybersecurity spending is rising, but nowhere near enough to, to combat the, the rise of the crime uh, rates. Only 52% of employees in the UK receive any kind of GDPR training, and that's going to be quite relevant as we talk some more about the DSPT. Uh, and more than 50% of businesses don't have the budget to recover from an aggressive cyber attack. Uh, they don't have anything in place. They don't have any cyber insurance. They don't have the means to recover. Um, and I think the stat is around 40% of the businesses that suffer a serious cyber attack are likely to go out of business within six months. The care is under attack. Um, another important quote, so with the increased burden on the healthcare system, cyber criminals know they have golden opportunities to make money from healthcare targets. Uh, breaches in the first three months of last year were up by 273% on the same period in 2019. Now, this all might seem like dry content and, and a little bit dull. Um, my, my point really is to re-emphasize that you are in a sector, whether you're in small independent care homes or whether you're part of large care home groups that will at some point be hacked. Uh, you will suffer accidental breaches and the impact of that because of the data that you process is going to be really significant. So this is why we're going to be talking about DSPT today. Um, and why it's so important not just to tick a box and think this is something you've been asked to do, but it's something that you really need to do because it helps you to put good uh, security frameworks in place. So a bit of a fact check at this point because I find some confusion with regard to the DSPT. So please do not confuse the NHS DSPT with the GDPR or the Data Protection Act 2018. They're very different things. Uh, the DSPT does not in its own right and by itself protect you and make you immune to the general data protection regulations. To explain that in more depth, the DSPT is the NHS's way of ensuring its providers work to data privacy best practice and can be trusted with NHS data, which is very much uh, how Izzy described it in her, in her opening uh, introduction. Whereas the GDPR and the Data Protection Act is man mandated in UK law, and it's been so since May 2018 and it's overseen by the Information Commissioner's Office, the ICO. I hope that everybody on today's webinar has heard of the ICO. If not, please uh, drop me a line and we'll talk about that in a bit more depth. Uh, they have significant fining powers and they will publicise all of their fines, uh, which means that if you fall foul of the ICO and you're fined by them, they will publish your details on their website and the world will know that you have had a data breach. Uh, so, in short, the DSPT is a measurement and it's a tool used by the NHS to check that you can be trusted with their data, essentially. The GDPR and the Data Protection Act, UK law, 
to the maximum fine of £17.5 million pounds, or 4% of annual turnover, just to put that in some context. So while the NHS DSPT is very, very important in respect of care providers demonstrating best practice and security, it is not the be-all and end-all. Um, data privacy, cybersecurity, information governance, or GDPR compliance, they are not issues you can choose to adopt or focus on or put off until you're ready or, or when you think you can afford the time to focus on it. It's law, it's law now, and it has been since May 2018. So I just thought that was worth emphasising before we talk too much about the DSPT. And as an example, Doorstep Dispensary, uh, a London-based pharmacy, their supplier of prescription medicines for care homes, they were fined £275,000 by the ICO because they failed to ensure the security of special category data. And special category data is the same data that care homes will be storing and processing every day. So that's just a bit, a bit of context um, on the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office and their powers, uh, and the fact that the DSPT is important, but in respect of data privacy hierarchy, the GDPR is much higher, and that's where you should focus your attention as well. So the DSPT... Yeah. Richard, there's a question that's come up just on okay. the chat, um, which you might be covering. It's okay. just asking, is toolkit optional, as we already have robust cybersecurity and protocols in our organisation? That's from Tracy. So if okay. you could put that in, that'd be lovely. Yeah, I'll answer that now. So, yeah, so it's not optional. Thank you. Um, you. You have to evidence those. If you have good standards, that's fantastic. But you have to have to evidence those standards to the NHS. And you have to evidence them through completing your DSPT and it needs to be reviewed and republished annually. So it's not a one-time effort. Um, they are absolutely mandatory. Um, every organisation that processes NHS patient data or has access to NHS systems should be publishing a DSPT every year. Um, so I will cover that in a bit more depth, but I think hopefully that's answered that question. Um, it's an online self-assessment tool and it allows organisations to measure their performance against the National Data Guardian 10 data security standards. All organisations that have access to NHS patient data and systems must use the toolkit, as I've just, uh, I think that was the answer to the question really. Uh, and it provides assurance to the NHS that you are practising good data security and that the NHS can trust you with their data. Now, this is important because it reflects very closely on access to system one in care homes, and it will also be core and absolutely central to the uh, national early warning score and remote monitoring. So this is all, when you talk about data and anything that's facing the internet and is connected, your risk of, of accidental or deliberate attack or breach is very, very high. The NHS, as with Matt Hancock's um, announcement a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, about connecting health and social care more to the NHS and GP surgery. The only way that's possible is through trust in data sharing and proving that the private sector is secure. Um, so this is the DSPT is the tool to achieve that and, and to prove that. In terms of who needs to publish the DSPT, it's quite a long list of organisations or types of organisations. Um, I won't read through them all. Um, this is available on the NHS. DSPT website, and I'll provide a link for that as, as I go through. Um, but it's pretty much every organisation, even prison service, that, uh, that has access to NHS systems. So let's look at the purpose and the facts and the benefits of the DSPT. So the purpose, it's about proving to the NHS that any organisations that have access to patient data must provide assurances to have the proper measures in place to ensure that NHS information is kept safe and secure. So even though you might have fantastic um, exemplar standards in place, you still need to prove it by completing the toolkit every year. Uh, it's also a contractual, contractual requirement specified in the NHS England Standard Conditions Contract. So this is, um, talking to Lorna and Izzy earlier this week about this uh, second bullet point. This isn't a stick to beat anybody with, but it is a fact that if you're not publishing with DSPT annually, you are in breach of that contract with NHS England. So that's something to bear in mind. There are no heavy implications in, in respect to that at the moment, but it's something that to be acutely aware of because it does leave any organisation vulnerable should the NHS start to raise their, raise their game in terms of mandating, mandating this process in a bit of a heavier way. Um, and it remains Department of Health and Social Care policy that all bodies that process NHS patient data for whatever reason provide assurances via the DSPT. Uh, and it's also necessary for organisations that are using national systems such as NHS Mail and the e-referrals service. 
you may already be using NHS mail and that was afforded to you on the back of COVID-19 in March. Um, access to NHS mail was relaxed because of, of the COVID situation. However, I would fully expect that access to be revoked at some point if you aren't publishing with the SPT. As I mentioned, it's an annual assessment. 2020-2021 um, deadline was June 30th, and that's something you need to do in order to remain compliant. Uh, and as data security standards have evolved, the requirements of the toolkit are reviewed and updated. And I've seen this on a regular basis. Um, and supporting uh, Lorna and Courthouse with their DSPT, I could see it evolving even during the fortnight that we were working on it. Um, so that it's updated. And the reason it's updated constantly is because cyber threats evolve constantly. So if we're not evolving the toolkit and if the NHS doesn't evolve the toolkit, it will be very quickly out of date and won't be fit for purpose. So they need to evolve it constantly. Uh, and the result of that is that the DSPT will ask things of you maybe in six months time that it's not asking of you now. Um, very difficult to know what that might be. Organisations to uh, with access to NHS patient data must review and submit your DSPT assessment in each financial year before the annual deadline. As I said, that's June the 30th this year. Uh, and the DSPT also provides organisations with a means of reporting security incidents and data breaches. This isn't just about making you do something for the sake of it. It actually should help organisations such as care homes to become more equipped to, to, to deal with cybercrime, more equipped to have good control, technical controls in place to protect that data that you've been um, afforded access to. In terms of the benefits, it reassures those people that use your services and the families and, and your staff, because your staff come into, into scope here as well. It's not just about residents and patients, uh, that you're managing their information safely. And most people would expect or assume actually that you would be doing so securely anyway. Um, and they may expect that you would share that data. So for instance, as an example, if you were using a payroll system, payroll software, effectively you're sharing personal data, employee data with that software provider. So that's, that's normal, but they, they, your employees will expect you to do that securely. Um, also, in terms of the CQC, and I'm going to talk some more about them soon, uh, it helps you to answer the CQC's key line of inquiry question about how you manage data securely. So for that, uh, see Chloe uh, 2.8, and it demonstrates that you meet legal requirements, in two, including the data protection legislation I've talked about before, such as the GDPR and the Data Protection Act. So the, the DSPT will help you to become more GDPR compliant, which is good. Uh, it also enables you to access key services, such as NHS mail and shared care records. Uh, and it's been identified by clinical commissioning group as a requirement in order to access system one. Now, this is something that I'm working on with CCGs in Gloucestershire and BSW, which is Bath, North East Somerset, Swindon and Wiltshire, to help care homes to achieve standards met, which will then allow them to get access to system one, uh, which allows them to have access to real time live patient data from GP surgeries and the NHS, which is what Matt Hancock is talking about. That's all about connecting the whole sector. Um, evidence of annually published DSPT is likely to be requested during your future CQC inspection. So definitely expect that to happen. And also, as I've seen in Cornwall over the last couple of years, local authorities are now starting to to focus on data security as well, and they will be looking at your NHS DSPT as well, uh, as well as your CCG. So there's, there are various parties here that are expecting you to be on top of your DSPT. Within the, within the DSPT itself, there are 10 sections. Uh, these very much are close to the National Data Guardian's 10 standards. So we need to provide evidence and answers to questions about how you manage personal confidential data, your staff's responsibilities, making sure they understand uh, what they're responsible for in respect of data. You need to provide evidence of training, um, how you manage data access. So you may well have an IT company that will do that for you. You may not. Um, how you review processes, how you respond to incidents. So if you have a data breach, what would you do? In the event of business continuity planning, if you had issues in the care home and your systems went down, how could you recover from that and, and keep working straight away? And number eight is quite important because this, I think, probably reflects some of the care home sector where unsupported old software and old tech is being used. That is, because it's unsupported and it's old, it's more at risk of being hacked. You're more at risk of being hacked because of it. There are some questions about IT protection, making sure you've got good IT standards in place. And we also need to look at your supplier. So who are you sharing personal data with? So, for instance, who do you use for DBS checks, payroll, uh, pensions? Uh, and such like accountants even and your IT companies 
who are you sharing personal data with and why, and are they secure? So the CQC and the DSPT, uh, as I said, they're aligning quite closely now. Um, organizations registered with the CQC will have data security included in their well-led inspection, where the DSPT considers as key evidence. It's only natural that the CQC would want to look at something, uh, something tangible to give them reassurance rather than making up their own guidelines. The DSPT is where they're going to go to look for evidence of good security standards. Uh, and from, a, from an information government perspective, all of Hi, your records, Rick. sorry, go on. I'm just, I'm, I'm aware of slightly of time, but also of the, yeah. the chat bar and people getting a bit worried about um, how much they'll have to do. And I just wanted to reassure everyone that obviously D DCHT will be working really hard to help hold your hands. We you know together with yeah. Rich and everyone else to, to, to talk people through. I think in the next couple of minutes, have a think everyone, if if you have any questions about this and obviously we can, we can put in the chat bar, the email um, for the DCHC that, so that we can start yeah. filtering some of the questions that you might need. Yeah. And Richard, as you, as you kind of tie up, because I'm just slightly aware of time, but we can yeah. then we can then possibly get you back another time to answer some of those questions. And, Absolutely, and yeah, no problem yeah. at all. So yeah, so I'm, I'm nearly done. And, and to echo that, you know, this, this isn't something that should undo, unduly worry you. These are things that ideally we should all be doing anyway. Um, however, help is there um, to get you where, where you need to go. Um, as, as was explained there. So what you can see on the screen there is just generally a summation of the fact that CQC is definitely going to be looking at the DSPT. Uh, and what it means is that if you do have inadequate data security standards or if you're not publishing your DSPT uh, and doing it annually, that all has the potential to negatively impact on your CQC rating. So it's just something to take away today that um, these are lots of reasons, positive reasons to, to get, get stuck into your DSPT. Four key factors also to take away, I think very important, that will help you with your DSPT. Um, definitely have training in place for your staff in respect of GDPR data privacy, so that's on induction and annually reviewed. Make sure that it's included in your employee contract. Um, make sure that you, if you can, have an IT provider from outside to help you with this stuff. Uh, and also number four, which I know is the bane of Lorna's life, is the record of process and activity Europa. That's basically an Excel spreadsheet where you record the different types of data that you, that you have and you store and your reasons for doing it. I'm happy to have a conversation separately about ROPAs and maybe run a training session on those because I think that'd be really useful. That's a mandatory requirement of the GDPR. So if you haven't registered your DSPT, and I know we're going to be running a session on this, uh, but just go to um, the website on the screen now and, and just have a look at it. Try to register if you can. It's very straightforward, five minutes, um, just to get started and have a look at the toolkit. Uh, Time for questions. I, apologies for running on a bit. It was always going to be a tall order to get this done in 15 minutes. But uh, like I said, it's gone through at pace, but I'm here to answer questions. You can email me, give me a call, um, or we can have a second session on follow-up, whatever suits everybody. So. Thanks, Richard. I mean, we, we've got two sessions booked, and if you haven't registered, they are both at an introduction to register you. So rather, if, you're, if you don't even want to go away and try and do that now, you can literally join us on either the 25th or the 31st. Izzy will send those um, event details out again. And you can do it at the same time as Richard does one. <laughs> so it just takes you through yeah. the whole process and makes it painless. Yeah. And we'll be running sessions through April. So if you're already, say, at entry level, we'll be showing you what does it mean to get to approaching standards or through to standards met. So, um, it sounds a lot, but don't be overwhelmed because basically that's why we're here to break it all down and try and make this process as simple and straightforward as possible and sharing if you need policies or sharing if you need templates to do stuff. And that's why, as Richard alluded to, so um, Izzy and I have taken courthouse through the process. So we know what it's like from our, in terms of as a provider or a manager, getting from a, we were entry level through to standards met and where we needed to plug gaps. So there'll be more coming on, the, on this topic, um, but yeah, conscious of time and, I'm, and, and just send us if you, if you, yeah, thank you, Izzy. She's just posted in the chat bar the registration for the events. Um, or drop us a line to, the, to our emails or the info at email um, if, you just, if you're interested but don't know where to start. Thank you. Well done, Shall I hand okay. over to Lucy? Lucy? <laughs> Lucy. <laughs> Which Thanks Lucy? That. That, was a, that was a great canter through what I know is a very 
complicated um, process. So well yeah. done and look forward to seeing you more in the next um, few meetings. Um, Welcome everybody. Uh, we, we hit the ground running there at two o'clock, so apologies to, to not welcoming you properly, but um, I hope that was helpful. And um, to, to reiterate, there's, there's plenty of emails we can answer on that one. The other person we must welcome is Dr. Lucy Pollock, uh, who has written a very wonderful book. Um, and Izzy, I'm gonna ask if you can share your screen to the little slideshow we put together, because Lucy has, uh, in this book, uh, put together an extraordinary amount of information um, you'll see, <laughs> you'll see in here that um, one of the things that um, I'm using as a bookmarker to mask, which I think says everything about COVID-19, doesn't it? 2021, I'm reading a book about growing old and I've got a mask as a bookmark, which is wonderful. Lucy, could you give us an introduction? Tell us a little bit about yourself and, and you know, where you work and, and the kind of things that you get up to. Okay, hi. It is really lovely to be here. I'm so glad to be here. Um, and I also just to say, my God, I, I feel for you. Care homes and IT is not a natural mix, really. And I and it makes me feel sweaty palmed what you have to go through. But I'm sure that you will all get there. Um, I am um, also the other thing is interestingly, I don't know if you know this 10 to 3 is the nation's most sleepy moment during daytime hours. So uh, if everybody goes a bit dozy at 10 to 3, that's completely understandable. Um, I've got a cup of coffee right here. Um, I'm a geriatrician and I trained at Cambridge and then at Barts and then I was a junior doctor in East London and I didn't know what to do and I did lots of different specialties. And then one day I was talking to a senior doctor who wasn't a geriatrician, but he said he hoped I wouldn't be offended, uh, but he thought I should do geriatric medicine. And the minute he said that, I thought, you're right. That is, a, of course, that is exactly what I need to do, because I find older people, as you do, interesting. And also, some people are less interesting, and people are different, and they are all people, and they have stories to tell, and their medicine is really complicated, which I like, because I find the complicated medicine very interesting uh, and challenging. And I like the fact that they're on horrendous medication regimes, which gives me lots to think about. And I love that they have difficult families or interesting families and that they need to be seen in the whole with the setting that they live in and the things that are important to them and things that aren't important to some people are vitally important to somebody else. So I love that detective work. I love working the team. I absolutely adore working with nurses, HCAs, physios, OTs, social services, blah, 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 the whole thing. It's um, cheap as I don't know how I would have got through lockdown without the company of other people at work. Um, including patients and it's very easy to make a mess of geriatric medicine and to get things wrong and make things worse for people and so that's been a bit of a passion for me. Um, so basically that's it, I really love my job and then I've been lucky enough to be able to write a book about it so that's... And it is yeah. a wonderful book, I mean a lot of us have read lots of very wonderful books over the past year, year or two by Rachel Clark, Adam Kay, you know, mm -hmm. Ben Goldacre, there's lots of books out there that talk about the experiences of people in the medical sector and, and they debunk myths and they talk about some of the things. Now, the thing I think that's really clever about this book, and Izzy, I'm going to ask you to share the screen if that's okay and, and start um, showing some of the slides that Lucy and I put together on this, because what this does is, <clears throat> and I'm trying not to make this into a great big advertising spiel, because this is what it's going to say, <laughs> and I'm not a commission, even though we share the same name. Um, this book is really, really lovely because it's actually aimed at people on both sides of the um, bedpan, so to speak. So it's for, it's for the residents and the patients, it's for the relatives, and it's also for people who work in care. And one of the things I think you do really nicely, Lucy, is you debunk some of the things that we might hear talked about, some of the academic papers. And in slide two, um, I've just snapshotted some of the academic papers that you refer to at the end of some of the chapters in your book. And you, in your book, you cover lots of things, polypharmacy, you cover dementia, you cover driving, but there's there's also science behind it. And I just wondered if you could maybe just sort of praise some, some of the papers here and just talk about, you know, yeah. why, why is it falling such a detriment? Why is it such a significant event for so many older people? Um, I think that's a, a very good question. And sometimes about falls, I talk about a concept that's a bit of a sad one, but it's a concept of life diameter. So if I took the whole world, I sometimes draw for my students a big circle, and there's a little dot on the surface, and that's my husband surfing in Sumatra. And that's what he used to do. And so given enough money, time, and permission from me, he could go off surfing. So his life diameter is the whole globe. But if you have a fall, 
your life diameter shrinks. If you go to Australia to visit your grandchildren and you break a hip, you may never go back to Australia again. If you have a fall on holiday in Portugal, you may never go back to Portugal, Sainsbury's, your garden, and eventually your life diameter may be a care home and at the very end, bed, chair, commode. And it isn't always just falls that does that. That's actually part of natural aging is to reduce your life diameter because the important things get closer and closer to you. But actually it's sad when you lose a quantum leap downwards in your life diameter is often related to a fall. So falls really are important. But the other thing that's important about them, and one of the things I've written this book about, is trying to work out what is common and what is normal because lots of people are muddled up about that. And so there are things that happen as you get older that people think are just normal, getting confused and muddled, having falls, becoming incontinent. You know lots of people who've got those problems, so you kind of assume that they're gonna to happen to you. And we all know that those things are common, but not normal. And that there may be things that we can do that reduce the risks. And falls is a really good one. We can't prevent all falls. You lot all spend your life um, trying to explain to a family why somebody has had a fall and the reason they've had a fall is because you're giving them a really lovely happy life where they get up and do things and the only way to stop people falling over is to make them sit in a chair but and you're never going to do that which is fantastic but you do we all recognize that there are things we can do and a lot of that is about medication and I'm sure you must have seen again and again patients of yours who've been on perhaps too many blood pressure medicines which were good for them when they were in their 70s but now that they're frailer and into their 80s and 90s actually their blood pressure is going down and down we don't lots of doctors don't realize this your blood pressure starts going down 14 years before you die it goes down two years before you get a diagnosis of dementia it's very closely associated with dementia so actually and all so there's lots of things that we can do so that's the sort of study that i talk about and um and I really wanted to write this book for my patients and their families because quite early on in my career, I had a sort of blinding moment where I realised that in the conversations I have with people about should mum be taking all these tablets, should I be for recess, should my dad go into hospital if he's ill and so on, the power was in the wrong place. I had all the power. I know what the questions are. I know what the answers are. I know the words you can use. And that's not fair because my patients and their families were they, they have these questions but they don't know how to ask them they don't even know if they can say that are you allowed to say that you really really love somebody and you wish they would die of course you're allowed to say that but but we can't so we have to be able to say that kind of thing um so yeah as, as lucy says i have it, it isn't all science but what i've tried to do is use a, a few really important studies that just illustrate why there is actually a real evidence base, why we can be confident about what we're talking about. Um, and some of the studies are done by, not this isn't all just doctors, there are therapists and people in health and social care involved in these, in these studies as well. And I think the other thing that you do is you put it into normal English, actually. So, I mean, and it's not just about the academic papers. I mean, uh, Izzy, if we, if we went to slide three, you can see this. I've just, again, snapshotted some of the resources that you've, you've linked to. Yeah. And they're all kind of accessible things. You know, the Age UK, you've, you've linked to um, the Alzheimer's um, a website as well. Yeah. And, and videos as well. So, again, I mean, we've, we've, there's an awful lot of information in that slide. But, again, even in, in slide four, um, you can see some really key key parts that, that have that that video for example that you link to the, the dying is not mm -hmm. as bad as you think it's a brilliant video and it, and, it, and it opens that door for difficult conversations doesn't it she uh, it, it, it does that's a, a lovely video that's a lady called Catherine Mannix who's a palliative care physician from the northeast and she wrote this uh, very beautiful book um, called With the End in Mind which some of you may have, have read that's a very short video of her explaining what a normal dying process is because so many people don't know what normal dying looks like and one of the most therapeutic things I can do for somebody especially people with breathing problems with COPD I'm sure you're familiar with this there are people who are terrified when they get breathless that this is going to be their last breath <gasps> they're going to die gasping and being able to say to somebody actually do you know even with your terrible lung disease that is not what the end is going to be like the end is going to be you're going to sleep and you'll wake up and then you'll sleep some more and in one of those sleeps you will die that is a much more common way of meeting your ending so um i think being open about that but yes she talks about it beautifully so i, I quote her words there's, there's a 
couple of there's two marvelous bits i'm going to just i'm not going to read too much out of the book but in page 276 that is a brilliant piece that you write and you're talking about a lady that you call frida and she's a very smart 91 year old lady she's had a hip doctor um, she's come to one of the community hospitals to get back on your feet and and you know that things are beginning to kind of she's on that beginning of that decline and, and her tep isn't in order and you want to have a bit of a conversation with her and you sort of begin to start explaining that resuscitation might not be perhaps the most appropriate thing but you know you would do everything you can and and the way you put it is, and I'm sure a lot of us have been in this position you patted my hand oh yes that sounds nice what a good plan let's try everything and then you start then you start. okay and I just wanted to can you talk a little bit more about that and maybe you know we've all got experiences yes yeah. uh, and that was a situation in which it was um it was probably about 10 years ago and I don't know if you remember there was a very big campaign that we should discuss resuscitation with everybody and we haven't really got the hang of the fact that lots of people do not have the capacity to have that conversation and we make assumptions about their ability to understand resource is a really complicated subject um, if, you, if one gets into the nitty-gritty of it and I was having that conversation with this lovely woman and I remember it so well because her daughter was there so I thought oh, this is the perfect moment I'll chat with her because the daughter's present and I glanced up because I could see this frantic movement behind Frida's chair and she was saying oh no I'd like everything I'd like everything and her daughter was going like this <laughs> which was just at the moment at the time pretty shocking but I could and I realized that I had got myself into a corner with this lady where actually I was doing something that was unfair to her. I hadn't planned the conversation. Um, I was actually in danger of offering something that would have been a futile intervention. And so I ended up stopping the conversation, talking about something else, talking to her daughter, finding out that actually she already had a really good escalation plan done with her GP when she had capacity from several years ago, absolutely did not want to be for resus, and uh, her daughter put me straight and, you know, we got it sorted. But I think one of the things one realises how how easily the conversations can go wrong if you are not ready or not trained or experienced or you get yourself caught up into saying things that aren't quite right the other thing i do really carefully in the book is explain the law because lots of people don't know that and people think about the hippocratic oath they say oh well, we know you have to do everything and you think oh well, steady on a doctors don't ever take the hippocratic oath for everything and b in the hippocratic oath you end up if you do ever have to take it, it you're signing on endless gods and goddesses from two two and a half thousand years ago it's a bizarre thing um, but actually doctors are governed by the GMC guidance and understanding what the GMC guidance says about the prolongation of life and uh, is, is actually really important and lots of people miss out that step so I, I explain exactly what it is that doctors have to do and one of the things we have to do and don't is listen is find out what our patients wishes are is listen to their families talking not about what they want for their mum, but what they know of their mum's wishes. What would she have said if she was able to speak for herself? Um, what is of value to her? What does she enjoy? What does she want to preserve in her life? What's the most important thing to her? And, and in I've learned so much from working in care homes, Lucy. I, I, that was something I started doing a few years ago um, on a very small basis. I don't, I don't want to um, over-reg it, but we set up this... this um, lovely project to do escalation plans with our residents and their families and spend real quality time doing that and I'm incredibly grateful to Colleen who I hope is on this call for helping us get that going um, and I learned so much from those good conversations about how you give people the time to express their wishes. Absolutely um, if anybody has any questions for Lucy please do raise your hand or put them in the chat bar as well. Oh, yeah. So one of the things I thought, and I think you are very mindful of other people's thoughts, in page 196 you, you say something and it actually made me stop in my tracks. You're talking about behavioural and psychological symptoms of dementia and you've been talking about different sort of examples of that. And then you stop at the bottom and you say, there are lots of moments in this book when I want to stop writing because I'm worried about how you are feeling. And it literally stopped me in my tracks because we, I think we've all had experiences of, of watching other people grow, grow older but you are so focused at that moment on the reader and I think that's such an important part isn't it? Is to be mindful of who else is in the room and, and mm. how, what, are, what are they hearing from you? 
Mm. Uh, and, and you're so right because you realise that these conversations, when they go well, these conversations, they are the best thing I can do for somebody. They are phenomenally therapeutic for an individual and for their family. Um, and yet you can get them wrong. And you can get them wrong if you have the wrong person in the room, not enough people in the room, you've gone and left out a brother who's going to go, you know, bananas when he hears about this conversation. Or you've got somebody in the room who can't understand what's going on like Frida. Or you've got the right people there, but they're not at the right point in the journey for this particular conversation. So I'm very aware that I do tackle some very difficult subjects and BPSD obviously is a really big one. And if you're living with somebody who's got sort of fairly early dementia, it might be very difficult to look down the track and see what's coming. That may be, may be hard. So I wanted to put that warning in there. It was a sort of, you know, you don't need to go on reading about this if it's not right for you now. Um, and and just just put a little flag to say, OK, if you feel all right about this, go on reading about it, but it's going to be difficult. Um, but then I think the other thing that I really wanted to say, writing this book helped me clarify some of my thoughts. And one of the things I feel really passionately about is the taboo that's associated with dementia, the shame of dementia. And I call that that chapter, you know, um, we didn't want to say it because I hear that all the time. Oh, we, we thought this might be dementia, but we didn't want to say it. Why do we not want to say it? It is because dementia has got this taboo. There is a feeling of shame about it. Somehow that somebody has done something wrong, that, they're, they're, that something about their life or their personality or something has brought this upon them. And they must be hidden away because their behaviour is embarrassing. And they, um, you know, they say things to the neighbours or things on the phone or they forget to pay for things in a shop or whatever uh, and we have got to get over that and and harnessing the energy of people who work in, in social care is part of that because you know that people with dementia are people and you know that pe those people live important lives that may not be a value to external viewers but are a value to them and their families and the people around them and that is a really key message. Um, I also really wanted to describe good care in this book, and I, I some people you could accuse it of being too of being almost naive, but actually what I have done very carefully at each point is to describe what good looks like and to emphasise that good exists. I think there's so much bad press out there, which is wrong because actually most care is fantastic, and and in a way, perhaps the pandemic has shone a little bit of light on the good stuff. Yeah. And do you think as well, post pandemic, if we ever get to be on that point, you know, for, certainly for the care of the elderly, there will still be some parts that will continue to endure that will not have been, it will not have changed by COVID. Hmm. The, but there will be things that, so what do we hope for on the other side of COVID? Let's, let's grab the moment and say, what do we hope for? We really hope that we have a society that does open up. I really hope there will be more intergenerational work. I love it when I hear that there are primary school children in a care home. I think that's really important and it's win-win. I think there's this other thing is that we're very much in danger of saying that older people need resource, 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 and that means young people aren't getting whatever. No, that's completely wrong. Everything that is good for old people is good for young people. Decent housing that's cheap and easy to pay the bills for is good for struggling families. Decent transport that's reliable and accessible is good for a mum with a push chair just as it is for somebody with a walking frame. Um, decent hospital services that are, aren't chaotic and calling back for appointments every three minutes on just different days. You know, those are insane for everybody. So all of these things that make things better for older people make things better for young people too. And the other thing is that I think a lot of people don't realise how good old people are for young people. So we talk about how good young people are for old people, and it's important uh, to, for older people to see little children, but actually it works the other way around as well. And I've been spending some time thinking about why that is, but it's partly about perspective, and it's partly because older people Young people, one of my colleagues said, they're on the roller coaster. Life is a roller coaster and it has terrible downs. And when you're younger, even when you get to midlife, sometimes you're in a down, you, you don't think there's ever going to be enough. You, you know, a relationship ends, you don't get the job, whatever, something awful happens. And you feel as though it's never going to get better. 
the older person has got to the end of the roller coaster and they will often look back and I say, you know, you've had an amazing life. And they'll say, well, you know, it hasn't all been good. There were some terrible things. You know, I have tried, you know, husband number three is the nice one. And, you know, that kind of thing. And they'll say, I would never go back over this. You know, the bits of my life I would never go back on. But the big picture is it's been a great life. I've enjoyed it. They're almost not on the roller coaster. They're looking at the roller coaster. They can see that there's ups and downs. And I think that in this world where everything is presented as perfection is the only option. Everything has to be, you know, you've, you've got to have long tanned legs and you've got to have a perfect car and a perfect house and a perfect set of children. Life's not like that. And I think older people help us to see that that doesn't matter. So it's about raising the profile of the elderly and, and maybe also raising the profile of, of social health and social care and the work that's yeah. within it. Yeah. Yeah. But, but very much so. So some of it's a practical guide, you know, what should I do about incontinence? <laughs> uh, giving people words to discuss it. Uh, you know, how do I reduce my risk of falls? How do people in care? Um, one of the things I feel very strongly is about empowering care home staff. I think you're great advocates for your residents. And one of the things I learned from doing those visits early on with Colleen was listening to care home staff saying, we never wanted Sam to go to hospital. It was awful that he went to hospital. Um, we dread coming in on Monday morning and finding that Margaret's gone into hospital. That's not what we wanted for her and so on. And thinking, well, hang on a minute. How can we bottle those conversations? You know, you know about your residents. Or, you know, I'm trying to force somebody to take 11 different medications at breakfast when actually what she really would like is a bit of toast. That is important. And capturing, you know, uh, empowering care home staff to be able to say, hang on, steady on doctors, can you just take a look at this person in the round uh, and listen and think about what we're trying to achieve with their medications, with their escalation plan, what matters day to day to them. Um, that, that I think is part of it. I think it's about just giving everybody a little bit more knowledge as well, so that they're in a position where this power imbalance is, is, is balanced out again. Absolutely right. Now, I think everyone's so enamoured with you that they're listening to you, which is wonderful. <laughs> we don't have any questions for you. Um, Izzy and I have been working on a little web page which will kind of translate or transmit, I suppose, some of those slides that we put together um, onto a kind of resources page. So uh, we're going Izzy, to... I love that. I I'm very grateful to you for that. Little... Do you mind if I nick that presentation? Because actually it's absolutely perfect. It's really kind. Um, because I think um, I think some people will love reading academic papers and some people will find them absolutely terrifying. And the same goes for some of the resource pages as well. And I just think you, we've got lots of people ordering the books. We're ordering the books. Yeah. <laughs> Are you doing a sequel? <laughs> I have to say, they did say what I wanted. I just at the minute I'm getting over having having written that one. And um, I mean, it was a lovely experience. I'd love to do it again. Oh my lord! But. Um, but just at the minute, I think I just need to take a deep breath, get rid of my mask, stop looking after people with COVID for a while. And, um, and so don't we all feel like that? And everybody, everybody needs to have a two week holiday somewhere along the line between now and next winter. It doesn't matter where you go, it can be at home, but you've got to have two weeks back to back. I, I, I'm afraid I think that's a rule. Have you seen a lot yeah. of a, a lot of COVID in, in your care of the elderly in the last year? Lots and lots. I had COVID very early on um, because my husband got it in London before the lockdown. Of course, I didn't believe he had COVID. I told him he was being wet and get out of bed and get on with it. And then our daughter got it and had a positive test. So I kind of, um, yeah. But that meant that actually I felt confident about looking after people with it because I felt I was very low risk of transmitting it to people. And then I joined the SIREN trial and I'm hopping with antibodies and I now have my vaccine, so I'm double hopping with antibodies. Um, I did end up looking after a lot of people, therefore, with COVID on lots of different wards, including surgical wards that didn't want to look after medical patients because we, we, we in Taunton, our surgical block, beautiful, new, the surgeons have been saving up to build it since about 1950. They only got it a couple of years ago and we stole it immediately for COVID because also single rooms and uh, they were not happy um we've still got one one ward of it um but it was hard because it was a real hearts and minds work with with surgical nurses they're lovely people but they did i mean everybody wears gowns the patients are all in gowns I see can we just get everybody dressed or at least in pajamas no gowns all the way down oh cheapers so um it's been hard work and of course actually it has been incredibly sad because the patient experience has been truly dire because for older people, I mean, I was looking after all ages, but a lot of them were older. 
with delirium and dementia in a side room where you've got a SATS monitor on and the nurses turn the monitor around so they can see the number through the window so they don't have to come in to see you. And it's really, really hard. And I, I, it was heartrending, to be honest. And the lack of visitors and the lack of personal effects and um, the fear and the sadness, I think, you know, people, and this is in Somerset where we've got a quarter of the rate of the rest of the UK. Um, I think how have people managed in London, the northwest, the northeast? Unbelievable. Um, so yeah, uh, I think very hard. And and I have seen. Um, I think COVID in care homes has been truly awful for anybody who's been through that experience. I would like to wrap my arms around you and give you the most massive hug because I know it has been a truly, truly awful experience for a lot of people. And there will be people on this call who have absolutely experienced that firsthand. So that's that's very well. Um, thank you, Lucy. I think um, has anybody got any questions? For you? I'm just very appreciative. No, I think it's just a big thanks, isn't it? For, and people are, are obviously keen because they're ordering your book. <laughs> so I'm <and> also. <laughs> We do recordings of the meetings, so we'll send a link out with the recording. Oh, bless you. Thank you very much. What a lovely group to be with. And my, my publisher will be happy. <laughs> so, so that's kind of you. I, I think Thank one you. of the things we've all found, certainly in Devon, is that working collaboratively is, is enormously helpful <gasps> in lots of ways. And that's yeah. why we're all here now. And um, I'm sure you've seen that in Somerset as well. It, it makes such a difference, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I, that was the experience I had of seeing a home that suddenly hit, the, you know, I mean, it's public knowledge, but basically, um, you know, we've had homes, at least one home, who found they had literally no staff. On one day, they had nobody in that home from manager down to cleaner who could come in because they either had COVID or were isolating. And the organisation that ran that home managed to pull it together and got the most incredible people to come in from all over the county from their other homes. And they just picked things up and ran with them and, and did this so beautifully. Um, so that kind of mutual support in an emergency where literally we didn't know where the sugar sticks were, you know, that, that kind of thing um, was amazing. But when it's not an emergency, still that sharing of good practice, that collaborative working, that um, appreciative inquiry saying, oh, you do it like that. Oh, that's a good idea. We'll take that back. How have you solved? I mean, look at you, the stuff with the uh, IT governance st stuff, sharing the knowledge there and saying, look, don't panic. It is going to be all right. We've done it and we're still standing. Um, that's phenomenal stuff. But so, yeah, well done. Well done. The Devon Care Homes Collaborative. That is really important. Lucy, would you come back in a couple of months and, and answer any questions? Or I would love to do that. I would really love to do that. Yeah, it's my favourite subject. Brilliant. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I'm just very mindful of time because you've given us well over an hour of your time, so I'm very appreciative. Can um, I quickly say hello to Lucy? Oh, Colleen, hello, my lovely. Hello. Nice to see you. Oh, big hug to see you. We'll meet up for gin at some point. We definitely will. It's been lovely to listen and see you again. Oh, thank you, Colleen. Thank you for all arranging that. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Goodbye. Bye, thank lovely. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks, thanks everyone. And the um, next one is, uh, third, I think, third week in April, I think. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we'll send the dates out for that. We're doing a little bit about um, exercise uh, for older adults, the guidelines that we are uh, should all know about but not, we don't so we'll do a little bit about that and also activities and if you have any suggestions on what you'd like to see in these um, meetings obviously they're evolving as we go so we would absolutely love to um, hear from you and if you would like to contribute if you'd like to present something please let us know because we're we're well up for anything has anybody got any questions anybody want to jump on and just take take it for get two minutes of fame or are you all very happy just in your three o'clock slumber no, nope, I think we're all fine. Time Brilliant. for a cuppa. Yeah. Time for a cuppa. Well done, everybody. We'll give you a link to the resources web page on the DCHE page when that's up and ready to go. And uh, there'll be a newsletter before you know it. And there's lots and lots of different meetings and webinars and fora in the meantime for us to see you on. And thank you for thank coming. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.